Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited for this program here today. My name is Edward. I am president of Chicago Ornithological Society. This is a uh, jo program brought to you jointly by Chicago Audubon and Chicago Ornithological, but specifically highlighting the work of the Bird Conservation Network, a really fantastic longtime alliance of many bird conservation and conservation organizations uh, looking to further well, bird conservation in the greater Chicagoland area. I am super excited today to um, turn the room and mic over to these amazing speakers to talk about the incredible work that BCN uh, has been doing with the Breeding Bird Survey and the landmark new study that came out that really synthesized all this data that Breeding Bird monitors have been collecting over the last 20 plus years. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my speakers and I'm going to um, let them take it off. One quick note though, just that if you guys have questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat at any time. The speakers will either get to them in the course of the program, if it makes sense, or we'll answer them at the end. There will be time at the end of the program uh, for questions as well. Um, once again, just a reminder, please keep yourself muted during the program so as not to be distracting everybody else and talking over the speakers on accident. And with that said, I'm really honored to be able to introduce to you guys today, uh, Judy Pollack, Vera Leopold, Jeff Bilski, and Bob Fisher, who are gonna be speaking today about the many aspects of this program. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much, Edward. Yeah, and you know, just to introduce myself, I am um, uh, currently the president of Chicago Audubon Society and have been involved with the Bird Conservation Network uh, since it started. And um, also just note that Chicago Audubon and Chicago Ornithological are both um, members of the Bird Conservation Network. It's basically an organization that is a coalition of local bird clubs. So um, yeah, we're here today to talk about our, our breeding birds trends. And we're, uh, we're really very excited to do that. So you're gonna hear from myself and Bob who were on the committee that organized this trends analysis, and then also from Jeff and Vera, who are two of the monitors. And I'm hoping that if you're interested in monitoring, um, that you will contact me um, at some point. So, and you know, there's plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. And I'm also going to put up a list at the end of sites that are um, that are open uh, in case anyone here is interested. But you know, there's a lot of aspects to this presentation. A lot of it is just about how our birds are doing. Uh, yes. So I think we already talked about that 21 conservation organizations and we advocate bird friendly policy changes and uh, serve as a resource for um, researchers, land managers, conservation partners in the greater Chicago region. So um, this is, I think, our third uh, attempt at analyzing our data. And so We've got more than 20 years of data now. Um, so we have a really an enormous database and a lot of people have been monitoring from the beginning right on through. Um, so our data comes from managed lands. And so it's different from, uh, you know, what you would just see in your yard. It's also, it's also quite different from the breeding bird survey if you're familiar with that because that's a roadside survey uh, so you're, you're catching um, a lot of agricultural lands, you know, just kind of take a road and take it straight out. So we put um, points in the, in the preserves. Um, our target habitats are grassland, shrubland, woodland, and wetland. You know, you're not going to see much about uh, pigeons here, um, even chimney swifts, although we do include them. You know, they're, they're, we probably don't do the best job at monitoring them. We really do a good job at monitoring those birds that need um, those four key habitats. And, and really, we don't do a great job with wetland either. So grassland, shrubland, woodland are, that's sort of our, our where we really shine. Um, and you can see that we, we've got an enormous number of surveys that were done by volunteer monitors. And they were at two, uh, almost 2,500 points in natural areas around the region. And in order to include um, a point in our trends analysis, there had to be a minimum of 10 uh, sightings. Okay. <laughs> I think Edward uh, fell asleep. Okay, there we go, thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, we, we retained the services of a professional statistician. We did some fundraising 
uh, BCN really um, just gets money from member members every year as in the form of dues, and then we do some additional fundraising. And as you, if you're looking on the website, and I will post the website, um, you can you'll see that there's a confidence level. So for, if you look at that yellow throat example, um, we're really sure that 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 bird has been increasing over the 20 year period, you know, because the confidence level is just 0.5%. The Northern Mockingbird, uh, you know, we're a, a little less sure of, even though we're showing a big increase, it's plus or minus 3%, so it could just be sort of a moderate increase. And then you'll also see on there, birds of concern, um, which has to do with um, how important uh, it our region is for the birds conservation. So if a bird has a high uh, level of concern, that would be like level level one. Uh, it means that it, it's it's a very important bird for our our uh, region to pay attention to. All every bird that got any kind of a ranking uh, is a really important bird for us to pay attention to, but the the level one um, are the highest. And we consulted a lot of different um, national ranking pro um, projects in order to get those, those uh, levels of concern, partners in flight being one of them. And there are similar ones for all the other different um, you know, shorebirds and waterfowl, et cetera. So all, all that we have, all the results of our trends analysis are just this bird is going up at 2% a year, you know, this bird is going down at 0.5% a year. That's the only results that we have. So anything that you hear us say beyond that is really um, just our guesses. And, you know, they're educated guesses. We, we consulted, um, we did a lot of consulting of regional ornithologists, you know, showing them this data. We looked at research. We had a set of science advisors. And so, you know, we're trying to make some sense about what might be the causes for some of these increases and, and declines, but, you know, just know that we didn't study them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so boom, this is where we kind of start. And if you were to read our, um, our report, we got a long report on the website. Again, that'll be also at the link that I, I post. Uh, you know, you'll see that this is some of the introductory material that we, um, we really feel that this, um, this monitoring program has turned into something really valuable. Um, when we started it, we really thought that the main value of it would be to give land managers feedback on their specific properties. And we still feel that that is the main value. And we do a lot of work to try to get the insights uh, from monitors to those land managers and to put people in touch and to establish good communication there. But this secondary, um, this secondary aspect, which is doing a trends analysis for the birds on managed lands in our region, I think has turned into a more and more important piece um, of our work as well. Uh, so um, not only can land managers use it, uh, researchers can use it, and we have, you know, a fair number of reach, researchers that reach out and uh, ask us for the data. And then uh, through things like this and all the publicity, which you may have, have caught, you know, we did, I think we got a lot of great placements out of this, um, this survey. So that's the opportunity to educate the public. And we feel a real responsibility because monitors are volunteering their time to be out there collecting this data, we feel a real responsibility to make sure that the data is used uh, to the maximum. So one thing that this really does is it shows the importance of the forest preserves in our region. I think we take them for granted a little bit sometimes, but they are loaded with really important birds and the land managers in those preserves are by and large doing quite a good job of managing those those properties to, um, to maintain these important populations of birds that are found in our forest preserves. I mean, that's sort of the big overall uh, takeaway. Of course, we've got this dynamic landscape of bird populations. We've got all kinds of complex influences. We'll go into a few of those later. And then hopefully during the discussion, you can bring up other ones. But, you know, 
surprisingly, we're doing way better than the rest of the state. Like we had of the species that we surveyed, 56% of them were stable or expanding. Whereas in the rest of Illinois, um, as, as um, looked at through the breeding bird survey, it's uh, 37%. And to a certain extent, that's kind of a, a story of preserved natural areas versus what can survive um, out in agricultural and private lands. Um, um, but you know, it really, it really shows the value of the managed, the public lands that we have in our, in our region. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, again, I think pre preservation and restoration are working for many birds. Redheaded woodpecker is a great example. Um, I think Bob will talk about that, so I won't, but um, then, you know, manage, there's so many different birds and managing for some of them is still a little bit of a challenge. I think particularly our, our shrubland birds because we've had such a big focus on clearing invasive shrubs. Um, but definitely our region is a great model for balancing uh, habitat restoration goals. And we're eager to partner with land managers to facilitate that. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the specific habitats. So in grasslands, you know, we have a, a lot of grassland habitat here. And as you know, grassland habitat has to be big it's got, you know, the bigger, the better, 100, 200. We're really going for 1,000 acres uh, or 2,000 acres. That's what grassland birds really like. And we do have a number of grasslands in the region that are that size. And our local land managers have been working hard to make these big grasslands. Um, so the, um, uh, however, they had this, the lowest, um, number of species that were stable or growing, only half. The other, other habitats had more. Um, Henslow sparrows are doing great in our region. Um, and dick sissel, another one that's doing really well, although you know, dick sissel is a little bit of an opportunistic kind of bird. Uh, so it's hard to say what that's in response to. But I think the Henslow sparrows really, they really like our habitat restorations, which is awesome. Um, Field sparrow uh, also doing very well here in the Chicago area. I think um, nationally what's going on in the east, you've got those little forest clearings that are filling in because they're trying to go for more unfragmented forests in the east, which is appropriate, but that makes our um, grassland and shrubland habitats here even more important. Um, Sandhill cranes, I think, you know, that's been expanding and expanding and the expansion has reached into Illinois. So we've seen tremendous growth in that, uh, along with a lot of other big birds, right? The bald eagle, osprey. If it feels like the big birds are, are really doing great here. Um, but if you look at the bottom, this bottom, um, these bottom few uh, birds, like these are the, the birds of our grasslands. Grasshopper sparrow, bobolink, savanna sparrow, you know, those are very common birds in grasslands and they are declining. And we were, we were quite surprised to see that. Uh, we do know that bobolink and savanna sparrow are predicted to move out of our region due to, um, due to climate change. Maybe that has uh, something to do with it. Maybe it has to do with the aging of restorations, but, um, uh, you know, or maybe just some particular needs of those birds, but uh, that's something that we really want to look into more. We we did present these findings to the Grassland uh, Bird Task Force of Chicago Wilderness, and we suggested there that maybe um, uh, filling in with shrubs is an, is another um, reason that those birds might be declining, which seems quite possible. Okay, uh, next slide. So then we're gonna. Yeah, so these are the priority species. Uh, you know, they're up on the website. Um, you can see them. And if you're involved with habitat restoration, or whatever, we, we do highlight those priority species and there are a lot of them in grasslands. Uh, and then the other thing we did was we made up a list of uh, research questions. And we would love for you to take a look at the research questions. I think that's the next slide, Edward, yeah. We'd love for you to take a look at those and suggest uh, additional ones if you have any, if you have any to suggest. 
Uh, okay, so let's go on and let's talk about uh, shrubland now. So, you know, grassland and shrubland uh, have a sort of interesting relationship, right? Like you can have, you can, you can have shrubland in woodlands or you can have shrublands in grasslands. Um, but a lot of, a lot of these uh, birds, uh, like for example, the brown thrasher or the field sparrow or the willow flycatcher, you really find them in open grassy areas that have clumps of shrubs. Um, and because our region is like sort of the epicenter of uh, buckthorn uh, domination, you know, I, I, I feel like it's moved out from our region um, uh, throughout the Midwest. Um, we really have this huge focus on getting rid of invasive shrubs. And a lot of times people just see that as all shrubs, you know, and, and a lot of times people are, are, are also accidentally or on purpose taking out um, native shrubs. So we, we sort of feel like it's really great to get rid of those invasive shrubs. And it's great that we had this sort of focus on it, this real culture, but now it's really important for us to start thinking about restoring the shrub layer. And that's something that Chicago Ornithological Society is doing at uh, Labau Woods. You know, they're sort of a pioneer in how do you restore the shrub layer for birds? So uh, we do want to, um, you know, just kind of keep, keep a focus on, on shrubland birds. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so you can see that a number, um, a number of them are doing okay. Um, you know, especially those ones that really sort of like uh, edge habitat, uh, but also common yellow throat, you know, which you'll find out, out in the grassland in clumps in the grassland. It's great that that one is doing okay. And then um, I would just sort of highlight like the willow flycatcher, which really particularly needs clumps of shrubs in open wet grassland. Um, so, um, you know, that's one where I think we can, uh, by educating, uh, do a better job for, for that bird. And then these are the priority species. And, you know, hopefully when we get to the discussion, we can talk about more, more of these birds. I'm just kind of going through quickly now. And then we also have the list of, um, the list of research questions. And this is all um, this is all in the report on our website. And as soon as I uh, turn it over to Bob here, I'm going to post um, the uh, the link to the website, which will show you uh, not only each individual species how it ranked, but also we've got a report where we um, we talk about this. So okay, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Fisher now. Uh, and well, first things first. Actually, we have Vera now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, okay. I am turning it over to Vera. Okay, well, I'm so happy to turn it over to Vera because she's going to be talking about one of my favorite places um, and this beautiful picture. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Vera Leopold. I work for the Wetlands Initiative, which is a, a member of BCN. We joined in 2015. Um, and I, I kind of uh, started doing the monitoring on, on my own, I guess. So it, it's sort of work related and sort of just something that I decided to start doing. So I just wanted to um, share my experience with monitoring at Kildare Wetlands. And actually this site has a lot of different uh, names that you may have heard. Um, it's kind of the Bartell Grassland Complex. It's also um, Bobolink Meadow, Tinley Creek Wetlands. So there's, there's several different names for the various parcels that are part of this complex, but I always knew it um, going back a while a ways as Bartell Grassland. It's in uh, Southern Cook County and it is recognized uh, since 2003, it was recognized as a land and water reserve and protected by the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission part Part of the reason, or a big, huge reason, reason for that, is the extensive restoration work that's happened there of the prairie and wetland habitats. Not, not by the Wetlands Initiative, by by many other uh, conservation partners in the Chicago region. Um, probably too many to name here, but it's really, really there's some awesome high quality uh, habitat there, especially for grassland birds, which many of you probably already know. So uh, I've monitored Kildare Wetlands, which is the the northwest portion of the complex since 2018. 
And that left half of your screen here, you can see this was actually the map that Judy first gave me when, and the other folks, um, there's a couple different people who monitor it, um, different parts of the complex. Judy gave us this map when we started and you can kind of see it's neat to navigate to the different points because it's all laid out on a grid systems, which you don't actually have to use GPS to navigate to the different points and everything's wide open. So you can easily get to the different, different points you need to find um, without, without bringing along GPS or pulling that up on your phone. So you can kind of see, and I can't um, really point with my mouse here, but everything is labeled. Um, Oh, if you go back for a second, uh, there's um, there's a letter and there's letters and numbers. So each of the point has each of the points has its own unique letter and number, and they all have different. They're marked by posts actually out in the field. So when you go out there, you can see the huge lines of posts going down off into the distance. And if you see these um, these pink circles here, the big uh, pink circles show the points. So I have nine different points that I survey in my portion and um, they're labeled by the different letters and numbers. So I kind of navigate just looking for the right points between those and, and follow a route and do that twice per summer. So this is shows one of the points with the pole that marks um, and the pole is actually painted with the letter and number. Make sure you find the, found the right one. And um, being out here first thing in the morning is just beautiful. Uh, there's so many different grassland and wetland birds around and they're really abundant. So, you know, Judy mentioned that bobolinks are declining overall, but there's there's a huge number of, bob of bobolinks at Bartell grassland, probably thus one of the names bobolink meadow. And it's just really neat at the points and walking between the points to see them, the, the males doing their song flight, singing and flying over the grassland. And um, what, one of my last visits, I actually saw eight male bobolinks sitting in a, a bare little tree out in the field together. So I've, I've seen them holding food, which you know is, is an evidence of breeding. So it's just really neat to see that many of that special grassland bird out there. There's a good range of uh, there, the Henslow Sparrow, one of our Chicago region uh, stars is, is out there in decent numbers. There's, there are many, many dick thistles out there and a few meadowlarks, not that many meadowlarks in this portion, it must not be quite ideal habitat for them. But you know, the, the henslows and, and dick thistle, which were increasing in our region are definitely, are definitely out there and benefiting from Bartell grassland. And then some of the species that I think of as being found in the wetter areas, we get some swamp sparrows out there that I record on surveys. I usually record sedge wrens which are interesting because sometimes you don't hear them start singing till later in the summer. Uh, there's many, many yellow throats out there. And uh, in certain years, um, I, I usually hear one or two rails. I didn't actually have any this summer, but it was a pretty dry year out there. It's interesting to see how each year the, the water that's out there that is um, kind of at the surface varies a lot. So usually this is the wettest point, this R9 shown in the photo. And you almost always need rubber boots for that to, to get to that point. But there was no standing water there this year. And in past years, I think in 2020, for example, it was a really wet year and uh, there was standing water all over the place And when I was walking from point to point. So there, there are certain years when there's more rails. I think in that 2020 year, um, there were multiple pairs of Virginia rails that I could hear squeaking and squawking and scolding me as I was walking between points as I moved into their territory. So a, a lot of really neat birds are out there and it, it varies a bit from year to year, which is interesting. Um, next slide. So, and something I, I like to say about the monitoring experience is you do have to get up pretty early. You know, if your alarm goes off at, at 4.15 in the morning, um, but I, I like to say that you don't ever regret being out there and seeing the sunset or seeing the sunrise. <laughs> Um, you don't ever regret having that experience once you get out there. It's just beautiful. And I had so many different sunrise photos from all my different survey visits. So I had to choose just, just one, but it's also just really neat to see all the native uh, plants out there that you can just walk through acres and acres of blooming rattlesnake master, like you can see in this large photo. And there's, there's lots of blazing stars. You can see the monarch butterflies flying from flower to flower. And um, it's just, it's, it's a pretty incredible place. 
So that was my photo from the last, um, my second monitoring visit this year. That was that was the end of my season monitoring at Bartell. And it's just, it's overall monitoring is, is just a, an awesome experience. It's a great way to get to know a local site. You know, I grew up about 10 minutes away from here in Homewood. So this is a site that's kind of close to my heart. And then I had a lot of early birding experiences at when I was a teenager. So it's just, just neat to visit that and see, you know, what birds are using it from, from year to year. And it's exciting to see when, when something like a rails are there. And then it's also kind of reassuring to see and hear the, the birds singing and, and doing their thing um, every year, you know, that they're a bunch of them are there. So it's overall, I recommend it to, I recommend it to everyone. And that's it for me. I think Bob is next. Well, the woodland habitats uh, don't have the vistas that uh, Vera just talked about. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you can't see for a mile. Sometimes you can't see for 100 feet. So uh, I think there's a big difference there. Uh, but that being said, the, uh, uh, the woodlands of, uh, are, are, that we've been monitoring, they're the most inter intact ecosystem in the area. And this number of species that uh, uh, occupy them is, is the largest group. It's about 66 species. And uh, the 50% plus of the, uh, of the points in the database are woodland points. Uh, so uh, obviously woodlands are historically and presently very important uh, habitats uh, for our nesting birds. Um, Happily, uh, there's a fair amount of good news for the woodland birds. Uh, about a third of them are actually increasing in numbers. Another uh, uh, less than a third are stable, but we do have uh, some species that are showing declining, and they certainly are, are deserving of uh, further study uh, for the reasons, if we see if we can figure out those de declines, whether they're climate related or whether they're uh, management practice related. So the um, habitat, you can see it's a pretty impressive list of birds that are increasing uh, in, uh, in our woodlands. And uh, uh, that is really good news. I put my glasses on to read the screen. <laughs> but uh, obviously we all know that not that long ago, pileated woodpeckers were largely absent from our area and now they are uh, if not abundant, they are certainly e relatively easily found if you get into a quality woodland habitat. That may be a range expansion, not necessarily related to uh, what the land managers have done. It may be the fact that they're just reoccupying places that they once were in. And that may be true for a couple of other species uh, on the list. Uh, uh, that uh, that are they are they represent uh, perhaps uh, uh, range changes. In one case, the Acadian flycatcher is uh, expanding in our region, and again, not too long ago, it was largely absent. That we're at the northern edge of the Acadian flycatcher range, so uh, they may be expanding northward as the uh, I guess I'll say as the climate. Uh, expands their preferred habitat or climate expands north. The flip side of that, I think uh, uh, the ne next slide uh, shows that, uh, for example, their traditional counterpart, uh, uh, the least flycatcher is declining. And we're at the southern edge of the least flycatcher uh, uh, traditional territory. So what may be happening, uh, and this is a hypothesis, uh, not a fact, but what may be happening is the uh, least flycatchers are uh, heading further north and the Acadian flycatchers are also heading further north. So who knows in 10 years, they may be, Acadians may be uh, much more common than least in, in our area. And that's a, perhaps a fascinating, but um, suggestive example of uh, one of the effects of climate change. So habitat wise uh, and uh, uh, priorities, obviously uh, there are some species of great concern, most notably the red-headed woodpecker, 
And the good news about them is after the first 13 years we did the uh, monitoring, they showed a slow but steady decline. Uh, the last eight years, uh, they've stabilized and are perhaps even increasing. And I attended a meeting of the Oak Ecosystem Recoveries uh, Group, which is a part of the Chicago Region Tree Initiative recently. And uh, the, uh, when I said that, the question was, uh, why do you think that's happening? And my somewhat flippant answer was, well, you're cutting down fewer dead trees. I don't think that was a very scientific answer, but it may have some validity. Uh, again, there are quite a few birds on this list that uh, uh, at one point were more common than they are today. Uh, uh, chimney swifts, for example, uh, nest uh, in tree cavities when they nest in the wild. And uh, Judy alluded to it earlier, but uh, uh, oddly enough, chimney swifts in uh, in uh, certain areas seem to be, we're recording more of them. Uh, that may be because they come to natural areas to hunt for insects. And so we're not really sure whether the apparent increase in that species is related to uh, perhaps a change in their uh, foraging behavior or whether they really are increasing. So, we, again, as Judy has alluded to, we, we know a lot more, or at least we hypothesize a lot more about what's going on, but we need a lot of additional research. Uh, some of the big concerns are the ground nesting birds like wood thrushes and oven birds. Uh, low nesting or ground uh, is the lack of uh, uh, understory uh, when we clear out invasives, uh, is that affecting their uh, nesting success? That it could be, and hopefully we'll be able to do some work on that. And uh, again, there are some other species that appear to be expanding northward. Uh, summer tanager being a good example of that. And uh, the uh, uh, it's becoming more common around uh, Chicago. And that, be, again, could be reflecting either a return or a range expansion for that species. So. Uh, uh, the, the other thing we, we talk about sometimes is Cooper's, Cooper's hawks and uh, did they decline because of DDT and did they come back because of us feeding birds? And of course, uh, uh, woodpeckers, did the emerald ash for infestation have an effect, uh, a side effect of increasing uh, uh, woodpecker nesting success? So I think that's Time for me to turn it over to Jeff Bilski. He's going to talk about a specific uh, woodland uh, uh, area. Go ahead, Jeff. Great. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jeff Bilski, I live in Evanston. And about five years ago, when I first moved back, back here to Evanston, um, I wanted to find a place close to home that was good for birding. Quickly settled on Skokie Lagoons, and uh, pretty much I go there two, three times a week, more so during migration, and have really mapped it out. And a few years ago, I was asked to start doing the monitoring, um, and it's it's been a great experience. And I'll, I'll kind of walk you through uh, the points that I monitor, what I've found there. I've got photos of a lot of species. So yeah, this is the area that I go to. Skokie Lagoons is obviously large, but the, uh, the place I go is Erickson Woods, which is off of Willow Road, bordered by Edens on the west. Um, the trail that I follow for my monitoring goes through a field from parking lot down a gravel trail with a um, stream adjacent to it. Then you cross over the uh, North Shore paved trail and I follow along the river and work my way back to a picnic area in Skokie Lagoons. Uh, and those are my 10 points. A lot of good species there. Uh, next slide. So, a lot of the common woodland species are here. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll show you some of the highlights that I found. Uh, to prepare for the monitoring, um, I do spend a lot of time kind of trying to look for nests, uh, listening a lot, watching for clues. I'll sometimes just like crouch in the woods and, and sit there for a long time, watching an area if I think a species might be breeding there. Um, cause one of my, my things is I, I really try to find the nests or try to confirm that the bird is actually breeding as opposed to just on territory. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some of the birds I found. 
Next slide. Thanks. So these are some of the common species there, blue-gray gnat catchers. There's quite a few. Uh, a clue when you're near their nest. A lot of you are probably familiar with that wheezing sound that blue-gray gnat catchers make. The scolding sound uh, usually can uh, clue you into being near a nest. Rose-breasted grosbeaks, they'll do that kind of high-pitched sound, uh, like a metallic sound. Barn swallows, pretty much any uh, picnic area or building area, they're going to be making their nests underneath there. Um, they're actually a, a bird that does multiple broods. I was just at Skokie Lagoons yesterday and I saw a, a barn swallow freshly on eggs and some fresh hatchlings, so multiple nests throughout the year. Great catbirds, been very hard to find their nests, but I stumbled on this one when I was kind of bushwhacking uh, in an area and, and saw this bird sitting there on a nest, so that was pretty cool. Next slide. A lot of woodpeckers at Skokie Lagoons. There's a lot of dead trees um, that are that are really nice for them to make their nests in. These are three of the good ones. Obviously, northern flicker I think was mentioned as one of the species of concern. Um, so it's nice to see a couple pairs there. Red-headed woodpeckers are doing really well at Skokie Lagoons. Uh, I've only been monitoring it for a few years, but every year it seems to be like another pair shows up. This year I think three or four nests um, are active. Uh, obviously lots of red bellies too. Eastern Phoebe. So this is an interesting one. That photo is from a couple years ago. Um, for two or three straight years, they nested in the picnic area in the same place as the barn swallows. Although last year and this year, I did not have a nest for Phoebes. Um, Eastern wood peewees, several pairs of those. That was a, a cute photo of some of the um, fledglings sitting together on a, on a branch waiting to be fed. Kingbirds, there's a couple pairs at lagoons. Uh, usually they're kind of adjacent to a field. Uh, Ruby-throated hummingbird. Finding nests of them is really difficult, but one clue that I learned uh, when I was watching is ruby-throated hummingbirds will collect spider webs and um, like cottonwood cotton for their nests. So if you see a ruby throat collecting that stuff, and you kind of watch them. That's that's how I found this nest. I just watched it collecting and then kind of followed it to figure out where it was. Obviously, we've got the common waterfowl here. Uh, Canada geese are everywhere. Wood ducks. Um, one of my dreams is to find a wood duck nest and see the actual plunge of the baby wood ducks. Uh, I've not seen that yet, but obviously they're nesting there based on the wood duck carrying an empty eggshell there. Um, I thought I was finally going to uh, have my dream of finding a wood duck nest when I found this mallard. It was 30 feet up in a tree in a hollow. I was like, oh my gosh, there's a duck up there. This is going to be the wood duck. I finally found it, looked closer, and it was a freaking mallard. <laughs> Couldn't believe it, doing its imitation of a wood duck. Uh, there are a, a few woodcocks. So this was in late spring or early spring, I should say. I, I went in the evening and there were five or six woodcocks uh, painting. And I've had a pair of woodcocks throughout the summer in the woods in what I would call appropriate habitat for breeding. And it did show up on one of my BCN surveys. Um, unfortunately, I've not found a woodcock nest yet, but I, I strongly believe they are breeding there. Uh, Brown-headed cowbirds, unfortunately, do very well at Skokie Lagoons. I've seen just about every species feeding them, including this summer, a lot of prothonotary warblers feeding uh, brown-headed cowbirds. But this is a red-eyed vireo, I think, from a year or two ago on a survey. Um, and then black-capped chickadees uh, are uh, doing pretty well there as, as well. Um, that was a nest that I found. You can see the eggs and then the chickadee kind of looking at me through the cavity there. This was a fun one in the spring. Um, it took me four or five tries to actually find the nest. Initially, I would go to lagoons, walk my, my loop, and I'd find this one great horned owl every time in the same spot, tons of whitewash, tons of pellets, and I finally pieced it together. I was like, all right, this owl is always in the same spot. He seems like he's on some kind of territory. What's going on? And I finally figured out where the nest was. It was in this tree hollow. Like I said, it took me a long time, um, but it was obviously just a ton of fun to find this and kind of watch it and uh, see these two owlets grow up and eventually leave the nest.
there's a pair of bald eagles at Skokie Lagoons. Um, I don't know if everyone knows that or not, but they they have a nest that's on the island. So it's only, you can really only see it if you have a scope. Um, maybe early in the year, you can see it with bins, but having a scope is the best way to see it. And eventually the trees leaf out so much that you can no longer monitor it. So I don't know if they had a successful fledge this year or not. Usually I can find out later in the year because you'll see the young one flying around. So that's not known. And then osprey, super exciting. Um, I've never seen osprey at lagoons on this platform that's been there for years until this year, late in the spring, this pair showed up and you can see they were, they were definitely engaged in some kind of courtship. I saw them mating. I thought this was going to possibly be a nest, but I think it was just too late in the year and it doesn't look like they were going to be successful, but I'm, I'm encouraged um, because hopefully they'll come back next year and they can have a successful nest. These are my two favorite from this spring. Uh, these are both on this year's BCN um, survey. American Red Starts, I've been hearing them singing throughout all of my surveys, but I've never been able to find a nest. And you can see in the top left there, that's the tail of the female sticking out to the right. This nest I finally found this year. And I mean, I sat in the woods watching this area for a good half hour, just crouched down because when you're near the nest, they would be chipping a lot at me. So I finally just had to kind of make myself invisible and watch. And I finally was able to confirm there was a nest and there is a female on it. I don't know if they successfully fledged or not. Like I said, brown-headed cowbirds are a big problem at Lagoon. So it's possible that there were uh, brown-headed cowbird eggs in there. I, I honestly don't know. But just to find a nest, verify breeding behavior at Skokie Lagoons was very exciting. And brown creepers as well. Um, they've been breeding there for a few years. Uh, I think they're probably a bit more common around here for breeding than people realize. They're very secretive. Their nests are under loose tree bark. Um, I've only ever found one nest, but this is a fledgling brown creeper that I found at Skokie Lagoons this year, which is clear indication of breeding. And I was, I was really excited to get that photo. Next slide, please. This to me though, despite everything else is kind of the crown jewel of uh, Skokie Lagoons, several pairs of prothonotary warblers. I've got a, a male visiting a nest cavity on the top left, a female collecting sticks because they line sort of the interior of the nest cavity with these sticks and moss. Uh, and on the right is uh, some recently hatched hatchlings there that I was able to photograph. And then the next one is an actual fledged Prothonotary warbler, probably my favorite photo here. <laughs> so they're they're pretty cute when they're uh, when they leave the nest. And like I said, unfortunately this year a lot of brown-headed cowbirds are being fed by prothonotary warblers. But I've also noticed that there are multiple um, they'll do multiple broods in a year. And then these are sort of my most wanted uh, birds for Skokie Lagoons that I believe might be breeding there, but I haven't verified for sure. Um, I've had them all singing during breeding season. The most exciting, obviously, being the white-eyed vireo. There was a pair of white-eyed vireos at Skokie Lagoons this spring for at least two days. I think they left, unfortunately, because I've tried in the area to find them several times where they were, but that was encouraging that a species like that would be there. Um, and then these other ones, I suspect, are probably breeding in the vicinity, but I haven't been able to pin them down for sure. And that is uh, all I have. And I will pass it to the next person. I'm not sure who's next on the list. That's me, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, it, it all, it, it, this really ties in, Jeff's talk ties in with, you know, what is a wetland and are those wetland birds? Uh, we classify them generally as woodland birds, but uh, prothonotaries, for example, are uh, almost always in wet or uh, riparian woodlands, woodlands along rivers or streams or whatever. So uh, I think the one grouping that's sometimes confusing to everybody is wetlands because they are we're primarily talking about rails uh, other water birds bitterns coots uh, waterfowl and so forth when we talk about the wetland birds group and to be fair the uh, the weakest spot in the uh, bcn's uh, survey data is in fact wetlands because uh, a lot of those species are very difficult to monitor. 
Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to get to the places where they are. And uh, it's uh, difficult to uh, uh, confirm much more than their presence. Uh, uh, you can, you, it's very hard to see them. Sometimes they're very silent. And uh, so wetlands is, is, a, is a hole in our database overall. So we've, um, we've got reasonable numbers for 22 species that seem to be stable or increasing, but there are, there's a bunch of species where we just simply can't uh, gather enough data about them. So I think going forward, we're going to uh, hopefully be able to improve our wetland monitoring uh, methods and so forth so we can get a better idea of how they're doing around here. Uh, next one, Jeff. Uh, uh, Edward, sorry. Uh, yeah, here you can see some of the stats. Uh, Soras are apparently doing well. Uh, uh, swamp sparrows are doing well. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, we all know probably about the black crown night heron colony at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Lincoln Park Zoo. I'm not sure that classifies as a wetland, but anyway, they're there. But region wide, Dave. Uh, many colonies have disappeared. So, and we frankly, I don't think know why. Uh, another interesting bird that, that is uh, down and that may be due to uh, unavailability of nesting sites are bank swallows. So uh, we have some data, but we don't have enough. And uh, I think we want to know more about wetland birds. On to the next, Edward. So priority species, again, uh, everybody knows about uh, uh, the Monte and Rose story and piping plover. Uh, black rail and king rail probably, not probably, they do nest here, but they're just, they're, they're in small enough numbers and especially black rail is very, very difficult to locate. And American bittern, and I suspect everybody in the group knows about the common, the only common term quality that to our knowledge left up at uh, Great Lakes Naval Station. Uh, and Black Tern, the only place that, that I know of that they're nesting in, in the region is up at uh, whatever it's called. I wanna say Black Tern Marsh, but that's not the place up in I believe McHenry County, right at the Wisconsin border. So we have a lot of questions and not enough answers about the wetland species, but it's fair to say that, um, that uh, things like the influence of weather, and uh, uh, can we see a pattern, can we determine a pattern connections with uh, nesting and uh, let's say spring conditions, wet or dry. Vera alluded to that with rails, as did, did Judy. And with that, I think I'm going to uh, reintroduce Judy. I think, Judy, you want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the Bird Conservation Network, um, we're all volunteers. Um, and I think um, there are some positives to that. One is that it's very hard to get mon money to do monitoring. So you have very few of these kind of long-term monitoring programs. So uh, we're pretty unique um, in that. Um, and I think having this sort of view into what's going on with our birds um, helps us to play a regional role um, in the Chicago wilderness in terms of uh, engaging people in improving habitat for birds and educating people about the needs of birds. Um, so the, the, um, that 50% plus of our breeding birds that are stable or expanding, um, you know, that really speaks well to the work of land managers, conservation groups, policymakers, birders, uh, you know, monitors, stewards. Um, there's a long list of people really that contribute to um, making our local birds successful. And then we also, um, you know, don't wanna forget about the mi migration season. Chicago, extremely, extremely important for migrating birds. This survey, you know, focuses on, on breeding birds, but, we, you know, we could do another whole program about 
all the exciting efforts that are going on across the region for migrating birds. Um, so we are gonna you know, continue to do what we do. Uh, we, we are always looking for partnership opportunities uh, to leverage the data and answer more questions. We'd love to work with researchers on some of these questions and um, we like to be a resource for um, information. So, okay, here. So, you know, what can you do? Um, one thing I wanna just do before I uh, forget is that there was someone else, uh, Amanda Tikachek, who was gonna be with us tonight, but it's her birthday and uh, she's off celebrating. But also I just posted in the chat a blog and I know that Laurel Ross is on the call with us. And so it's a, a blog about another monitoring experience um, where Amanda um, and Laurel really has, uh, you know, had a dream of having, um, and having nest, nesting grassland birds at her site and so nature preserve and Amanda's the monitor there. And I won't give away the ending, but you, you can read the blog uh, with their story. And there are many, many stories like this, you know, throughout the region. And I think um, because monitors develop such a close relationship with their site and are able to watch the progress over years and are able to make relationships with the other people who care about the site, the land managers, the stewards, et cetera. A lot of monitors really have been able to bring about big changes at their sites. <clears throat> and there's a lot of opportunity um, to, to, to get involved with this. So after this is over during the question period, Edward is gonna put up a list of um, places where we still need monitors, <clears throat> sorry. But you know, I just wanna say what we do because uh, it hasn't really been said but you spend five minutes at a point and record everything that you see in here. That's just the basics of monitoring and you commit to two, um, two, two visits in June, in the morning in June. So it's a pretty minimal commitment, but that's a commitment that gives us the data that we need to make these trends. And it also gives you an idea what's going on with the breeding birds at your site so that you can um, share that information with uh, people who need to know it. Um, you know, the, obviously though, all the stuff that uh, Jeff talked about, you can also do, we, we enter the, all the data through eBird. And so there is that ability to enter the breeding codes. And, um, you know, we have a number of people that do that and makes it really fun and uh, exciting. And, and obviously, and also just, you know, like you saw with Jeff, just discovering, um, you know, new dimensions really to the breeding birds of our region. So I wanna like really, really plug uh, becoming a monitor and you can just contact me um, if you're interested and I'll um, help you figure out the right people to get in touch with. Then, you know, there's also just so many other ways to get involved with helping birds. Um, there's, you know, over on the side, those seven simple actions from Cornell, but then you've got advocating. Uh, there's real active groups advocating. Chicago Audubon does a lot of advocating. Chicago Ornithological does a lot of advocating. If you want to get involved with that, you can get involved with them. Up a little higher level, the Bird Conservation Network is advocating. Um, and those you can see some of the, the um, issues that we're all working on. And, um, you know, they all really make a huge difference for birds in our region because our area is uh, so important for birds. And then, you know, there's all kinds of other things. The Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, the Plover Monitoring, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways to get involved if you want to, um, if you want to help birds. Uh, for referendums, I just want to mention that there's that vote, vote yes campaign that's going on right now. Um, the, um, you're going to see a referendum on the ballot in November. Um, about uh, additional funding for the forest preserves and our organizations are definitely supporting it. Um, you know, that's a great way to get more, even more nature into our region. Um, yeah, I think that's it, right? Are we, so I'm gonna just hand it back to Bob, I believe now, let me just see the next. Yeah, Raise actually I'm gonna make right? a quick unscripted inter interruption here. Okay. To, to, to <laughs> say, speaking of the power of one, Bob, this is your cue. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead to the next screen then, if you would. <laughs> um, a, a quick story for everybody. Today I was uh, 
uh, I went out in my yard and uh, lo and behold, the uh, little object at the left side uh, is a carved wooden bottle link. And I thought, where the heck did that come from? And then it occurred to me that uh, I, I know a person who, uh, who uh, might have done it because she wanted to make the point of how important. And so she might have snuck into my backyard and placed it in an appropriate uh, location so I would find it. So if you would, uh, Edward, go to the next slide. And that person, of course, is uh, Judy Pollack. Uh, Judy is, in fact, oh. <laughs> the heart and soul of BCN. And uh, I could probably talk for an hour, uh, but you don't want that to happen. Oh. Uh, Judy was there at the beginning. She was the driving force to create BCN and fought to keep it going. And there were fights. I was there too. There were fights, there were uh, problems, but we kept it going. And Judy was the founder and creator of the Bird Conservation Network. Uh, I think those of us who know her, and I know many in this audience know her, you, Judy, your ceaseless dedication, your commitment, your work on advocacy, and all the things you've done to advance the cause of bird conservation in the Chicago wilderness region and beyond, I might add. I would add that uh, Judy's gonna be speaking uh, about uh, the uh, bird trends analysis and the success of our program to the Department of Interior uh, later this fall because they are they're having a conference and they are going to feature the uh, Bird Conservation Network's trends analysis as a model for successful and effective long-term citizen science. And that's because of Judy. So leadership, and I think we, all of us who know Judy, know how welcoming she is. Uh, I don't think she's ever, uh, I don't think she's ever discouraged anybody from birding, uh, that's for sure. Uh, so, on behalf of the Bird Conservation Network uh, officers and board, and I think on behalf of everybody here, uh, I hate to say it, Judy, but I often think of you as J.P. Bobolink. And that carving, <laughs> when you come to the uh, monitor's picnic in late August, and we're saying when, not if, we're going to make a formal presentation of that carving. So you better be there, to, to, otherwise it'll fly away. Oh. So thank you so much, Judy, for everything you've done for birding, bird conservation, and the Bird Conservation Network. Go on to the next, if you would, Edward. Uh, I think I would really like to change the, uh, the uh, attribution of this quote. Uh, yeah, Walt Disney said it, but Ju Judy practices it. The way to get started is to quit talking and start doing. And I can't think of a better example of that practice. So thank you very much, Judy. You are, as I say, the heart and soul of the Bird Conservation Network. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bob. I, yeah, I'm like really a little speechless. I, <laughs> things like this make me so uncomfortable. <laughs> but I really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. and. Um, yeah, and you know, I mean, it was easy. Uh, you know, it's not just me. It's uh, so many other people um, that I've really had the pleasure to work with. It, it's been wonderful. So, thanks. <laughs> you, uh, if since we caught you by surprise, I hope. Uh, oh um, yeah, you did. <laughs> good. That's 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 important. I, I guess we, uh, Edward, you want to open it up for uh, pick up some questions from the uh, from the uh, the chat. Uh, all right, great, cool. Beth Gabriel, how do we get involved with the monitoring program? Nice, simple question. Well, I can answer that. You can uh, either contact uh, uh, one of us through BCN, and uh, we'll get you started. Uh, a lot of people are intimidated by. Uh, uh, because of the need in many situations to learn the bird by ear, but it's not as difficult as you would think. And by working with a mentor or getting out with somebody else, 
remember, you don't have to remember 300 species by ear. You, if you can learn the species that occupy your habitat and, uh, and uh, it's not, it's, it's a, an important skill, but it's not, it shouldn't intimidate you and prevent you from uh, joining our ranks as a monitor. Yeah, I'm just going to share the list of, um, so these are the places that have monitors and the places that need monitors. This is only in the forest preserves of Cook County. There's also um, some Chicago Park District sites that, uh, that uh, have some decent um, breeding birds. So, but if anyone is interested, you know, for example, Fran uh, earlier on in the chat posted that he went to um, Plum, Plum Creek and he was uh, shocked at how the birds had declined there. That's a place where we don't have a monitor. We've never had a monitor. We really need one. So, you know, these are all places where you can make a tremendous difference. And I will say, now that Merlin identifies the bird songs for you, you know, it's, um, it's a, I think it's a lot easier to, to monitor, even if you haven't got every single bird song memorized. So I would really encourage you to do it. You know, it's just a, a really wonderful way to make a connection with a site. And I'm, you know, I'm the one of the county coordinators for Cook County, so probably the best thing is just to contact me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, Amy asked a question about data transfer into INHS and IDNR and so forth. Actually, th those uh, agencies, uh, Amy, have uh, have access to the data if they act. Uh, ask for it. The data is housed uh, on uh, uh, BCN eBird. It's uh, uh, it's part of the overall eBird database, but it's capable of being uh, uh, isolated, if you will. So we actively share the data. Uh, for example, if the Cook County Forest Preserve District has a question about uh, 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 an individual or a group of preserves, they can they can uh, get the data uh, for themselves. So that's uh, uh, one of our main themes: is uh, availability of the data to researchers, to land managers, to to people who want to uh, see what if they can use the data answer answer questions, et cetera, et cetera. There's another great question here um, from Amy Lardner about how the data that we are collecting here is transmitted to various land managers. Uh, she specifically noted, like, for example, Illinois Natural Heritage Database and IDNR. I, I would say that getting things into ECHOCAD doesn't really happen. Um, you know, we would love to have a volunteer who, who would um, look over our data and figure out um, which are the endangered the state endangered species and report those into EchoCat. Um, we do send, we send the whole database. We, we get it every year from eBird and then we send it out to all, like all local ma land managers um, that we know of. So the Illinois, um, the IDNR is definitely on that list. You know, I'm not sure if the person, the Echo Cat person is uh, it, it exactly gets it or not, but if you want to send us his name, his or her name, Amy, uh, we can be sure that that person is at least getting our database. And then it's, you know, it's just a, a big uh, Excel spreadsheet. So it's easy enough to sort for the, and they can pick out the uh, endangered species uh, uh, instances. There's another excellent question in here um, from Maureen McDonald. How will the research questions that were posed here get explored and answered? Uh, I would say that would be just by, you know, by just different um, researchers uh, being interested. So, you know, we have relationships with some of, some of them, not all of them. I think, I imagine that we'll probably make an effort to send this report out to uh, every researcher in the region that we can think of. Um, but yeah, really, it just kind of depends on, on uh, people picking these up and forming partnerships. If you're interested in one of them and you do research, 
go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, for example, we uh, there was a, a researcher looking at nesting sites uh, uh, used by uh, woodpeckers, and uh, he reached out to us, and we made uh, some specific data available to him to use in his uh, study. So it's it is available, and uh, people. Uh, can ask for it, and many people do. Got another really good question here from uh, Rachel Schaffnit. Uh, she asked, how many days, hours does a monitor typically spend at a site in a month or year? And I think that's just a great question, just in general. What does the monitor's commitment look like? The, the protocol is fairly simple. Um, you, uh, you go to a point, and uh, you occupy that point for in round numbers 10 minutes and you record the birds you see or hear you can go go much further as uh, as jeff bilsky showed you can look actively for nests and so forth but basic monitoring is probably four, four visits uh sometimes as many as six visits during the breeding season uh we the the database does not contain data from uh uh, any other period other than the breeding season in the in the area, so it's entirely focused on breeding birds. And I, I'm just going to add, since Bob is from DuPage County, but I think most people on on this call would be dealing with Cook County, uh, and the the um, protocol there is five minutes at a point, and then. Um, you only have to go two times during June, and we encourage you to go at least one time through all the other seasons just to get familiar with how the birds are using the site um, during the seasons. But really that minimum, it's just two morning visits in June, and the visits usually take two to three hours, and you've got to be done by 9 or 9.30. Yeah, just to chime in there for my visits at Bartell, I'm there by sunrise, and then I'm usually done about 8 a.m. and um, I do two visits in the in the summer, and then yeah, like like you just said, try to visit other times of the year. But those two are the key requirement. Another just another thing I'll say is, it's not as hard as it sounds because you're probably only going to be in one or two habitats, and it's a summertime, so you don't have to. There's no migratory birds, you know, there's no flocks of warblers that you have to figure out. So, you know, a lot of places you, maybe if you know 20 birds, um, you can do a great job of, of monitoring. I would add to Judy's comment that, that there is also value in monitoring a location that uh, may not have a lot of birds because that allows us to verify that maybe habitat degradation or a monoculture of invasives or something like that uh, may really cut down on the occupancy of our uh, nesting birds. So uh, uh, I, I, I have a little personal story. I was asked to monitor in a, uh, a dying uh, jack pine forest that was put in in Waterfall Glen. And it was really difficult to get to the point <laughs> because of all the fallen trees. And the only birds I ever found in there were chickadees. And I'm absolutely convinced that they, that they came in there to look at me to say, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> so monitoring is valuable if, if on a pristine site, but it also gives us good information if the site is being altered either by human action or other factors, because that tells us a lot about what the birds, how the birds respond. I'm going to throw in, um, you can also, you don't have to monitor by yourself. You can team up with a birding friend. And that's what I do. And I think it's a lot more fun. And when I started, I didn't feel my ID by sound skills were quite good enough to be a monitor. My friend is much better at it. So we have a really good time. And it's a lot more fun. That's a great idea. Sure. Everything's more fun when it's a party. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> I have a question. This is Fran. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, 
probably a tough question, but you know, you saw my comment earlier on Plum Creek and my question would be, can we use these surveys to influence the politics of land management with forest preserves, you know, Cook County Forest Preserves or the Chicago Park District? And have we been able to do that? I mean, is there, um, is there a correlation between the, the work that, that the monitors do and a change in policy to improve some of these habitats? Judy, maybe you want to comment, but my simple answer to that, Fran, would be yes, uh, they do respond. The, the, uh, the problem with some of the uh, departments is they lack uh, people to do the work, shall we say, uh, restoration uh, management. And uh, so that's why it's also important to, uh, to reach out to your county commissioner and say, uh, can, can we do more to manage these, uh, these places more effectively, not just for the birds, but for all of the animals and plants that occupy them, particularly when it comes to invasive species. So uh, yes, monitoring data is used. Judy, do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I wonder if there's anybody on the call who um, might want to give an example of how their own uh, monitoring changed was, you know, was impactful at their site. Well, well, I would just say, um, you know, I think we've seen a number of examples of it. One sort of good sign was that um, this, uh, like, you know, two, two, three years ago, the Forest Preserve District um, approached Chicago Audubon Society and asked us to organize a monitoring effort up and down the Des Plaines River. And you know, one of the things they wanted to know was where are the birds of conservation concern. So you know, we we sent them, uh, or we're in the process of sending them. You know, not only lists of birds, but also maps of where the birds of conservation concern are um, are nesting. Uh, so I, I also think, I mean, I just think that all of the, the grassland work that you saw going on, it had a lot to do with BCN just raising the profile of grasslands and talking about how important grassland birds are and then doing a lot to get the word out about what you need to do to have grassland birds, you know, which is reducing fragmentation because you saw a big spate of, of those projects um, that were going on around the region. And even though some of them are like million dollar projects. They really come from, um, they, they come from individuals, um, you know, who, who have the idea. Uh, and a lot of times those individuals are, are not uh, paid staff, you know, they're, they're bird monitors, they're birders. Um, yeah, I, I see that uh, birders and bird monitoring are a tremendous spark um, for great conservation in the region. And I, like I tend to think it's sort of like a three-legged stool. You know, you've got government agencies, uh, including land management agencies, you've got the big nonprofits, and then you've got the grassroots. And I think that they really all contribute in their own way to this kind of developing um, bird conservation ethic that we have in our, in our region. And, you know, you've also got a lot of specific monitors that are doing things like, it, like an easy one to point to maybe is, uh, um, Jenny Flexman, uh, who's out at Schomburg Road Grasslands and, you know, went and monitored and realized that there were these big hedgerows fragmenting the grassland, got the forest preserves. That was a, you know, she was bird monitor and also steward got the forest preserves to come in and take out those uh, hedgerows. And then through monitoring has shown uh, the big, um, increases, you know, and that was really like an entirely grassroots effort. And there are, you know, that she's one of several who have been able to do that on our site, at their sites. And I would say like a place like Plum Creek is just, it's just totally prime for that, you know, of having somebody who's down there, who's got the goods and can bring them to the forest preserve and say, look, 
this because they're responsive. You know, they're they're very receptive to that kind of thing. Um, you know, they don't want people going around saying that they're making declining bird populations on their property. And I, I think it's been, we haven't always had great relationships with the land managers, but we do now, you know, we've got very good relationships with them. And I think that's a, a key to success, you know, is that partnership. I think that's also a testament to the longevity, right? You know, you're not just some random community group that shows up and don't know what your deal is, but BCN has been doing this for just so gosh darn long now. It's clearly serious, legitimate. And at this point now there's a history and data to it that really shows the extraordinary value of what BCN and BCN orgs and individuals can bring to the table. I would add right. to that, Edward, that uh, this is a continuing project. And uh, I think Judy alluded to it already that, uh, that uh, uh, there are sites that aren't being monitored. There are opportunities for people to monitor. And uh, the more data we gather in the, over the longer period of time, the more valuable the database becomes. Uh, in Cook County, here's the example. In DuPage County, I don't think there's quite as many, but there's about a dozen sites in DuPage County, County that have no monitors on them at, at present. So uh, the birding community can help. For sure. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll jump in. I have one real quick. And I want to say thank you to all of you. This has been super inspiring and informative. Um, and I'm just so encouraged and grateful to know there's so much going on for birds around our region. Um, I'm wondering if there's a requirement or at least desire for monitors to be there for more than one year. No. There's a desire for monitors to be there for 20 years. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the most valuable data is the data that's collected by the same person, right? Um, but um, but yeah, like we're we're hoping that people will can commit to multiple year. And then when people have to leave, we try to find someone else to take over those points exactly so that we can have a continuous record. <laughs> um, you know what? I just wanted to, Jeff sent me a note and um, he and I work on this uh, Techni um, project, you know, with the, which is the water reclamation district. Um, and, um, you know, we've managed to convince them to stop mowing. They, they're they're mowing most, mostly through Jeff's efforts. Uh, you know, they've been mowing up um, little um, meadowlark babies and savanna sparrow babies that are nesting on the ground in their grasslands. And, um, you know, we've, we've managed to form a good relationship with them and get them to change their practices so that those young birds are not mowed up anymore. <laughs> so I think like that's another, it's another example. Um, of many. So like that's a that's a reasonably easy ask, right? No mowed up birds. <laughs> well, it's harder. It should be easy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> It'd be easy if you only on that lovely bird. Bird. <laughs> Well, no, the good the good news is we saved a lot of meadow larks, savanna sparrows, even uh, the very common red winged blackbirds this summer by partnering with the uh, water district and working with them to mow certain areas and protect certain areas. And it, it was a great example of partnership to, to make a, a, to protect the birds. So it, it worked out nicely. On that note, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap things up here. So if you guys have continued questions, obviously feel free to reach out. All of these folks here are more than happy to answer your questions. I wanna give a huge round of applause and thank you once again to our speakers, Judy, Jeff, Vera, Bob. Thank you so much for your time, your expertise this evening. Um, and then of course, for folks who were on this call, you're curious about learning more, the links were scattered all through the presentation, but you can also feel free to reach out to either the folks here or your local birding organization like Chicago Ornithological or Chicago Audubon, who are members of BCN and have been longtime founding members of BCN and are obviously are one of many organizations that are supporting this larger region wide work. Uh, so on that note, have a great week, weekend. Uh, avoid Lollapalooza traffic, and we will see you guys all on the next program. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs>